a beacon of liberty, beacon on the hill, or civil war? You know, this is the contention, and it's been that way a long time. And so here um, on Community Matters, we're going to talk about that today. But let's begin with, uh, with you, Peter. Um, we begin with Frederick Douglass. He was a black abolitionist. He was a very smart guy. Um, David assured me that if Frederick Douglass appeared at his law firm today, he would hire Frederick Douglass immediately. Uh, and he gave a number of speeches, and he did what a good speechmaker should do. Um, he wrote it out in advance. You know, you can get all his speeches, all his major addresses. You can get them on the internet, which is a blessing for us all. And he was a great thinker before the Civil War, and he understood this country. He was a great patriot um, and, and, and a great, um, what do you want to call it, historical analyst of his time. Uh, 1852 was the date of this speech, and it was about, uh, it was about slavery and, uh, and the country. Uh, and July 4th. Why did you send that around, Peter? And you know, what struck you about it? Well, actually, I think David sent it around. And uh, but I, it was an ast- actually the speech that I was looking at was called Composite Com- Composite Nation, and it, that was done in 1869. And Frederick Douglass was a towering figure. He'd been a slave. He uh, sought and create and created his own freedom, and just became a towering speaker and a towering figure in American politics. And in the composite nation, he articulated three principles that are alive today for us, uh, but under threat. And one of those was the the absolute primacy and frequency of uh, everybody involved, everybody there. Uh, We're all equality for all. That was one. The second one was uh, racial diversity. He said, we need to be a nation well, of many people. Uh, in Chuck's terms, we're not a, a melting pot. We're a salad bowl, a fresh salad bowl <laughs> of ingredients. And the third one, the third principle for him was religious liberty. So it, it was about absolute equality, racial diversity, and uh, religious liberty. And those three, he said, make for a, a vibrant nation. David, you, you you know, you remind me too, because you were the guy who sent it to me and I was stunned by it, stunned by the speech. Yeah, I thought it was a fabulous uh, speech that he had come up with. And and um, <clears throat> the reason why it was so brilliant and, and Frederick Douglass was an absolutely brilliant guy who was a slave, freed himself by escaping and then became a, a speaker and a writer. But the composite nation speech w- talked a lot about the fact that at that time, there was this anti-Chinese hysteria. Uh, This was the precursor in 1869, the precursor of the Chinese Exclusion Act that came in in 1882. And there was this giant fear of the Mongol hordes that were going to come over and take all the women, take all the jobs, take all the riches, and and wipe out the white man. Um, and, And to have this black man, who's a former slave, standing up for abolition, to say, hey, guys, don't be afraid of the Chinese. The Chinese are not this monolithic horde that's gonna be uh, loyal to the emperor. They're people just like us. And we should embrace them because they are hard workers. They want what we want, which is freedom, which is equality. And and they are gonna be hard workers and they're gonna move this country forward. And so for him to say that was a tremendous thing that I think was, prescient as well as a forerunner that that is important today because I see I contrast that with the Chinese Americans who have been in my word hoodwinked to take on the anti-black anti-affirmative action anti-Harvard affirmative action policies and say hey we 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 want like the current system because under the current system we succeed and the rest of you guys don't and so we need to do that now and i and i contrast that with that and and he had an ecumenical yeah wide open let's everybody get in here and let's all work together and it's going to work it was a fabulous speech and impactful you know just uh, one more thought to add on to what david said he was described, this speech was described as 
I wrote it down, audacious optimism coupled with fierce determination. I mean, what a tribute, what a tribute to something that's more than 100 years old, a speech. He could run for president today. Um, and, the, and the other thing, I just want to contrast that <clears throat> with his speech in 1852. Yeah. He gave a July 4th speech, which which was a, a very dynamic, but a, a darker picture, which where he was basically saying, hey, America, you're having this giant celebration of freedom, equality, liberty, truth and justice. And you're inviting all the slaves and you're saying, hey, you don't get to participate, pal. Uh, you're the worker bees. And he was saying that, you know, the worker, the, the blacks got paid for their work with the lash and religion. And, uh, you know, and the white man was getting all the money. And, and so you contrast that that picture where he's saying, you know, this is not right. This is wrong. And, 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 and making that statement about how evil slavery was. And then you go to 1869 and he's saying, he's saying, you know what? You can't be discriminatory against the Chinese, just like you can't be discriminatory against the blacks because, you know, four fifths of the world is not white. And these ideals of the nation are great. And if we allow immigrants to come in, they're gonna be hard workers. They'll do great things and we'll have a great country. So. I thought it was just a tremendous intellect who came up with this stuff and who gave these speeches. And and so much of what he said is relevant today. It's extraordinary. You know, he was talking about Passover and the Jews too. I mean, he had he had all these issues under his belt that are still relevant. And really extraordinary. He was a, a great thought leader. Uh, Chuck, your thoughts? All of those are important insights. Other things that are really important lessons for us now, <clears throat> Douglas, perhaps more than anyone in his time, recognized, elevated, and prioritized <clears throat> the value of diversity in all aspects of life, in relationships, in work, in decision-making. And studies have borne that out for several decades now. <clears throat> Another thing that he did that was really striking was that he emphasized the scientific basis for equality, that races don't qualitatively differ genetically. And all of those things are still part of the struggle on the table now, even though it's been 150 years that we've had evidence verifying that he was right on the mark. But what's troubling about it is just exactly how totally relevant that all his speeches were, his whole position. And um, I, I just I get concerned about the fact that we may may not have moved off where we were in 1852 or 1869. Um, and that's I guess that's the, the <clears throat> fundamental point of this discussion here today. We're still fighting those fights. Yeah. Yeah. We're still fighting the Civil War, yeah. and we're, and P.S. We're not finished fighting the Civil War. It's not as if we can turn around and say, "Oh yeah, well we handled that." We yeah. haven't handled it, and there are people who are into this kind of uh, racist uh, nationalism and uh, and uh, bizarre religion. He talks about that in his speeches, um, and we still have that. If if he were here today, he could, sorry, he could make the same speech. Terrible. You know, the other thing that's interesting to me <clears throat> is is that racism is not uh, just limited to whites against people of color. Uh, we have the recent example in Los Angeles where the Hispanic leaders uh, and the woman who was the chair of the of the board of supervisors or the city council was was caught on on a hot mic or or some kind of a recording making disparaging remarks. Uh, 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 calling the this black child who was adopted of a gay supervisor a monkey. I mean, just terrible stuff. And you had Kevin DeLeon and these other Hispanic uh, leaders not saying anything. And they were all plotting how they were going to hold on to power for Hispanics and, and, and denigrate the power for the gays and the blacks. So it was all about power, wealth 
money. And the story of power corrupting and absolute power corrupting absolutely is absolutely true. So that it to me, it's all about power. And that's what we have today. You've got elements of the Republican Party who will, like Lester Maddox, say or do anything to cater to the far right. I mean, Donald Trump, this is the biggest dog whistler of them all, talking about, you know, uh, uh, how fine people there are who were in the, you know, the KKK and, and having a dinner with Nick Fuentes, who he still has not avowed. Uh, Andy Borowitz had a great thing because uh, Trump, I, I, I didn't recognize the man because he was wearing a white hood. Um, uh, <laughs> Barwich. Barwich is too funny. <clears throat> so why did why did you send um, the speech that you sent around, David? What motivated you to do that? You know, I, because I found it one uh, intellectually interesting, fascinating. Uh, it it speaks so much to what we are facing today, and there is a dearth to me of. Uh, communication of these uh, intellectually interesting uh, uh, commentaries and broader themes that are so important. And so that's why I sent it around. I thought, oh, my God, this is so exciting to me to read this. And I'm thinking, my God, that guy was brilliant. And it was 100 years, no, 150 years ago, you know, when he did this stuff. And, and you know, we're still fighting that stuff, but we're, we're always going to fight it, I think. Yeah, and it's too bad. I mean, because at the same point in time that Frederick Douglass was writing uh, abolitionist um, speeches and giving abolitionist talks around the country, Europe was was um, terminating slavery. So, you know, with all our American exceptionalism, we were way behind Europe at the time. Peter, why why did you send your speech around, which is the, the one I mentioned in 1852, and when David was talking about what to the slave is the 4th of July. Why did you send that one? Around? Um, I don't, I'm not sure if I did send it. Maybe I did. I don't remember. But I, I tell you, the, the thing is that we, what, what hits me is that we are in a particularly dangerous and malevolent moment in the country. We're somewhat immune to it here in Hawaii. Not totally immune. I can tell you about that. But I think part of what's resonating is that we're in a, we're in a time and a moment where we're civil disturbance, civil wars, civil disobedience, civil confrontations are right on the edge. And January 6th was one version of that. I'm glad that, uh, you know, seditious conspiracy has found a name and they found a place and it's been established at least as a credible theory, credible, what, you know, penalty or potential penalty. So, so it's in contrast with uh, Frederick Douglass, what he was saying then, and what we are facing right now. That's the poignant thing for me. Mm. So, Chuck, well, the other piece that went around was, I can't remember who's sending what anymore, um, was called an atmosphere of violence, sto stochastic, S-T-O-C-H-A-S-T-I-C, uh, terror in American um, politics, the definition, this is a very simplistic definition of stochastic, is randomly determined, having a random probability distribution or pattern that may be analyzed statistically, but may not be predicted precisely. So, so Chuck, can you, can you connect these things up? We have that article, and we have the speeches by Frederick Douglass, and we're trying to make some connection uh, between the uh, middle of the 19th century and right now looking at no stochastic. Well, one of the things that we see graphically and tragically is that the mass killings, which were hangings, lynchings, and mass murders that were overtly and predominantly racial for a large part of the 19th and early first half of the 20th century, those are still continuing. They've just gravitated to a higher level of weaponry. <clears throat> but we're still seeing in synagogues, in mosques, in schools, mass killings that are very racially oriented, that are still throwbacks to exactly the kinds of 
prejudices, the kinds of divisions that Douglas was trying so hard to bring into the light and move forward. Are you yeah. saying we haven't made any progress, Chuck? Not much. <laughs> I heard that. You know, there was a moment when President Obama got elected where we were all patting ourselves on the back and saying we've turned a corner and it's a new era. And, and then after Donald Trump got elected, I sat down and I said, geez, how could I have been so wrong? How could I have misread this country so badly? Uh, and what are we going to do now? <laughs> OK, because, you know, I mean, it is uh, hopefully two steps forward, maybe one step back, as opposed to one step forward, two steps back. Um, so, I mean, I am hopeful, uh, but but it is, you know, a continuing saga. I mean, look at this latest uh, 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 mass murder in a gay uh, nightclub. Uh, where that guy was luckily stopped by a U.S. serviceman. Um, you know, just there's a lot of hate out there. And it's, it's and there's, you know, all the anti-Asian violence that has occurred. It has terrorized the Asian communities, the, the Chinese communities, the Japanese communities, uh, the elderly who are just in fear of random violence that is going to come out. Well, right? we have it and we can explore just how bad it is. But I want to explore with you, David, as a, a lawyer and a litigator, um, the, this whole notion of stochastic. Because, um, when, you know, as a lawyer, you see this happen. You see somebody like uh, Lindsey Graham get up and say, if you, um, if you indict him, there will be violence. And the question is whether he's reporting that as a fact, as a prediction, or whether he's calling for it. Uh, and the whole Trump dog whistle thing seems to be calling for it. Now, you, you have a lot of trouble, and they are in the insurrection investigation in Congress and maybe in the Department of Justice, too, connecting all the dots um, and saying, just because he said, Let, let's fight like hell, uh, was he really calling for a violent attack uh, on, the, on the Capitol? Um, and I think stochastic comes to mind here, because if, if you say, um, you know, I'm, um, all these people are good people, including the bad people are good people. Um, you're really encouraging them, giving them license, and they take it that way. There's a communication. Um, and I think, um, you know, you, you don't have to go too far to convince me that the, the fellow who made that communication is giving license to somebody who uses that communication to, you know, be violent. Um, so, does American law, David, it's a hard question, um, you know, does American law connect it up? Is, is this within circumstantial evidence? Is this, uh, is this whole notion of dog whistle and sto sto stochastic violence something you can prove in court? Well, I think it is. And I mean, yes, the Republican Party, which is enthralled to Donald Trump and the far right, has adopted the mantra that January 6th was just, was just another form of civil discourse uh, that was perhaps a little more extreme than debate, but not much, and certainly accepted. Um, and so there's a bunch of people who think that. Now, I think the courts and the lawyers are saying no, and that's why we're convicting a bunch of those people and sending them to jail. Whether Donald Trump will get indicted for his uh, uh, statements and his encouragement of the January 6th thing is yet to be seen. I mean, Merrick Garland appointed a special prosecutor to take a look at that stuff. And so I actually hope it happens. I don't know. The political wheels move slowly. But I, I think that the, the important thing is, is, is that this is happening. There are these calls for violence. They're thinly veiled. This is just another way it's, it's like when Mao unleashed the Cultural Revolution uh, by giving the signal to the Red Guards that we had to, you know, discipline the old people and we had to discipline ways of thought and just unleashing this reign of terror uh, as a political move. That is what Trump has done. That's what the Republican Party has done. That's what people are trying to do. And because the terror is not going to be visited upon them. 
or the far right. The terror is going to be visited upon the people of color, uh, the Asians, the blacks, you know, uh, and people who don't agree with the white supremacists. Um, you, know, you know, Peter, we've had in this in this year, 2022, hundreds, you know, different sources tell you how many hundreds, but there are hundreds of mass murders. That is more than four people killed, usually by, you know, assault weapons or high capacity weapons. Uh, and it's getting worse. Every year it's getting worse. And, um, you know, Trump uh, doesn't hasn't uh, condemned it. The Republicans haven't condemned it. Uh, the con condemnation by the Biden administration may or may not be strong enough. But my question to you is, we, we have this, uh, may I call it a civil war of violence all over the place, where there's more violence now than ever in our collective lifetimes, okay? And there are people who not only don't condemn it, they call for it. They remark about it. Um, they, they do lots of things that foment and encourage and give license to this kind of violence. Um, is there a clear, my same question, is there a clear connection there so that we can get, you know, some legal relief on this? Because I suggest to you that if there wasn't the dog whistle, the violence would not be at the same level. I, I'm skeptical. Uh, that, I mean, I've been in, involved, in and around the courts for a long time, and I'm very skeptical that the evidence will produce, be produced that will connect generic statements to specific moments and incidents. And that's certainly true with Trump and the January 6th piece. There's a stronger case on the documents at Mar-a-Lago than there is on the January 6th, but we'll see, it'll play out soon. But it, this stochastic business is all about what David said, thinly veiled statements that are uh, kind of aiding and abetting people's worst intuitions and impulses, and, and almost encouraging them towards violence, and not, certainly not doing anything to discourage it or condemn it afterwards. So, the, you know, the way it looks out, right, looks to me is, uh, you know, what you have are people who are angry and leaders who are angry, and leaders are speaking in generalities, and people take very specific precipitous actions. Hard to prove, I think. Hard to prove. I'll leave it to David and Chuck to be the the proof proof per, positive on that. Well, let me I, drop that one on uh, Chuck then. I'm skeptical. So what we have is hundreds of people <clears throat> who are at the insurrection have been charged, um, indicted, uh, convicted, and then and to varying degrees punished. Okay, but these are the recipients of the stochastic messages. Right. Uh, the dog whistles. They're the dogs. They're not the guy who initiated the message in the first place. Uh, and the guy who initiated the message, and there are a number of them, not just one, who initiated the, the message in the first place, he walks. So we need to deal with this kind of violence. I'm sure Frederick Douglass would have some ideas about it. Um, but can we solve this problem simply by looking at one side of the equation and not looking at the other? Because it's, it's rising. And despite all our efforts to prosecute these thousands of people who are at the Capitol, um, it hasn't changed um, the, the level of violence in the country. That's been going on higher. So yes, don't yes. you think we have to nail the people who send the message in the first place? How can we do that? Well, that's a great insight and a great question, Jay. And a couple of things that it brings out that Douglas highlighted years ago. One was that the more the need for the rule of law to be effective gets politicized in particular situations, the less effective it is. That's been a weapon that Trump, the MAGA Republicans, and the GOP generally have used to their very great advantage. The more they can politicize things, the more people push them away, the less weight they have in society, the less strength and motivation there is to actually enforce a, in accountability. And if you look back to Douglas's time, that's exactly what was happening then. The pervasive violence with virtually no accountability 
obvious to many. People knew who was involved. They knew who did stuff. <clears throat> and the second element of it is that Douglas exemplified by the model he set one of the elements that can actually help influence and change directions in areas like that, and that is the three C's, conscience, courage, and charisma in leadership to galvanize people <clears throat> that this needs to happen. The arguments have been made, but we haven't had people who have exemplified those three elements in ways that can bring people together. The MLKs, the Gandhis, <clears throat> the Mandelas. We could definitely use a few of those. We could use Frederick, Frederick Douglass, actually. Um, such we a clear thing. Could. I'd but love is, to put him up against simple? Mitch McConnell. <laughs> well, Mitch McConnell is of no help. <laughs> hero. He's a you zero. Know, he's not a hero. Hey, <clears throat> when I was in... Uh, I had a, a very influential biology teacher. I, I started out thinking I was going to be a biologist, an aquatic biologist. And I had a, a, a very good uh, anatomy, comparative anatomy teacher. And one of the things he said was, we don't know a lot about a lot of things. We know the temperature at which water boils, but we don't know which molecule boils first. So here you have these dog whistles. Here you have these big innuendo-laden comments made by uh, leaders uh, who really are are kind of using the at the anger that's out there. They're, they're using it. They're deploying it, and they they couldn't tell you what will happen as a result. And when it happens, they deny it. So we don't know the molecules that will boil first. We know the temperature at which things boil, but we don't know what will boil. But what we do know is that there's huge anger out there. There's a, so much anger. And I'm, I encountered some of that the other day. I mean, I, I walked to the public library here in my neighborhood and uh, somebody was pissed off and said, hey, what are you doing here, you fucking Holly? And I'm going, whoa, what? whoa what's that? What? What did I do to you, bro? What? 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 Yeah, so so there's just anger. And uh, people are now have so many means of expressing that anger on all the media channels and all the social media, whether it's Twitter or whether it's Instagram or Spotify, whatever it is. And so... <laughs> People haven't learned the art of shutting up yet. You know, Tito um, ran Yugoslavia for a long time. And uh, his thing was, uh, you, you want to you wanna act out? I'm going to get you. Yeah. You can't act out. And, and it was, a, you know, it, it worked. I mean, you know, he's a strong leader. He was a conservative leader. He was a, you know, an autocrat for sure. But with that approach, people did not act out. Uh, right. He left. But, but, but once he left, yeah. They really acted out. That's what I mean. <laughs> so, you know, you have to have somebody that says, I hold you accountable. Um, we don't have that, really. I mean, we have Trump, but, but nobody holds him accountable. And, and he would never hold anybody accountable on a moral basis. So I guess, you know, I come back to the question of um, we're in a, a civil war where people are acting out, but somehow they take license. Um, nobody seems to be accountable for this sort of thing. I personally, as Chuck knows, I personally doubt we're, go we're going to have uh, indictments here. Uh, and if we do have indictments, they're not going to be, they're not going to result in, in prosecutions and convictions and the like and before 2024. And uh, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, for that matter, Section 2 of the 14th Amendment is not going to come into play. Uh, so the result is that we may have a leader who is uh, bent on destroying the country for whatever reasons. And, you know, the problem I have is um, that what goes along with that is the violence, the very violence uh, that Frederick Douglass was talking about. Um, and I don't know if he had a solution in any of his speeches, but we really do need a solution. And you know what? Let me say that maybe we need to look at our system of laws differently. Um, maybe the stochastic thing has to be somehow respected in the rule of law, or at least given credence. You know, from a psychological point of view, I think all of us would agree that if Donald Trump gets up on day one and says, you know, kill all the Howleys, um, and then people go out and kill all the Howleys, um, he's responsible. What happened on January 6th? 
but the, the law doesn't really reach him for that, as you said, David. So maybe the law has to be changed. Anybody want to take a, a whack at that issue? I think the former attorney general here should uh, address that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I'm of two minds of that, <clears throat> which is one that you should prosecute bad guys and put them away and punish the hell out of them, uh, especially Donald Trump for doing and, and uh, the things that he's done and for opening the doors. On the other hand, uh, as having done some criminal defense in my time, uh, you know, if you don't have really rigorous standards standing between the state and the punishment of the populace, you can go off the rails pretty darn easily where uh, the power of the state, which may be directed at white supremacists today, could go off the rails and be directed at people of color and normal citizens tomorrow. And so that's the question, that's, that's the tension of having provable guidelines and measurable standards to convict people and hold the state to that um, because the power of the state is pretty darn awesome. Yeah, we knew you'd say that. We knew you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> what did you want to add, Peter? So, well, I wanted to ask David, what, I mean, isn't that part of the reason why prosecutorial strategies would say, go for the lesser charges that you can prove as opposed to the big one that you know is politically challenging and legally evidentiary uh, challenged. So, I, I mean, I think that's, you know, that when Al Capone went to jail on tax evasion. They didn't go there for murder. And uh, Trump is under fire really probably for Mar-a-Lago documents more than he is on, on the January 6th and being a precipitator of that. So, I, I mean, I think the legal system has some flex and they'll go after him, after people. And that's, you know, I think the, the bigger question for me is what that what is everybody so volatile and so angered about that they become weaponized so easily by leaders? I'm I just I, I, it's, it blows my mind. Well, you know, as sociologists, that's my field. That's what I. Uh, but it's the reality. It's the reality, it's reality. not yeah. something we can get under. But well, let me let me yeah. ask you this. So we have uh, someone said there's 600 events of uh, mass shooting per annum in this country. All right, it's bad, and and we have um, you know lots obviously lots of attacks on our our democracy, our Republican representative government. We have that, okay? and it's bad. But let me let me assume for a minute. Let me ask you to assume for a minute that instead of six hundred events, we have six thousand events, and it's on every street corner, and we have guys like Trump doing his dog whistle and people reacting out of uh, white supremacy or whatever. The racism, bigotry, um, and they're killing a lot more people. Um, and, and we have we have a, a dysfunctional or non-functional Congress and in various state legislators, legislatures, and what you know what we have is a complete lack of democracy. If he gets elected again, I think we're we're headed in that very direction. Um, so at some point, it becomes intolerable. At some point, this notion, you know, of uh, the rule of law as we have known it uh, may be under such duress that in order to save ourselves, uh, our public safety, in order to save our society, our democracy, we have to do draconian things. Not things we would like to do, not things we would want, not things we ever had to do, but in order to save ourselves. Do you see that point? Uh, I see a uh, little creeping tendrils of that. I see things that are inching that way. And I'll tell you a personal story. I have a very close buddy of mine who lives up in Washington State, up in a place called Anacortes, out in the ocean. And he's an artist. He's an oddball artist. And a guy I was in the Peace Corps with, he was in our group. And he's he's been a shooter. He's been a, a gun guy, but he's not a fanatic. And he has, uh, you know, he likes to go target shooting. He's got some old guns. And he keeps urging me. He says, Peter, things are getting worse. You want me to send you one of my 38s? And I said, no, nah, I got too many grandkids running around the house. I, nah, no, no. But, you know, I, I mean, I think that's the, the what we're moving towards is a lot of self-help and self-protection and armament. And I do believe that we will reach uh, something like a civil war. We're already creeping towards it. I, I've been writing about that. I have a 
a, a novel about that that's sitting with a literary agent. I think we're we're on the cusp of that. It won't be blue and gray as it was in 1860 and 65. It won't be like that. It'll be a very different kind of a more chaotic and a more anomic fight. But I do believe we're moving there and that uh, we, we're losing certain uh, of those qualities that Frederick Douglass was trying to champion about tolerance, about diversity, about equality, about, I, I mean, they're, they're, they're just eroding. Those things are eroded. And uh, in that environment, people will do start to do dangerous things. Whether that will happen what, what, why or not, who knows? What, what about you, Chuck? We, you know, we, we've talked about what does civil war, that's, that as it exacerbates, would look like. It's not going to look like 1861 or 1865. It's not going to look like that. I think we know that. Um, and it, it may be this kind of lone wolf thing that we see, but lots and lots of events, and we and we realize that that that's all sort of in a, in a, a political motivation. And and boy, the word political can reach out in every direction. You can politicize, you know, your breakfast if you want. Um, so uh, you know, what what about that? Um, where where is the breaking point? Uh, is is are we are we simply going to ignore that? Until it comes on, you know, on, in front of our house, uh, are we going to ignore that until we lose our civil liberties? You know, right now Jimmy Lai in in Hong Kong is being tried. He may very well, and he was a, he has been a, a beacon of your, of democracy there. Uh, he is a great hero in Hong Kong. Uh, he did uh, what was it, the Apple Daily Apple, for a lifetime, um, and now they got him in handcuffs. This is this is a very genteel guy. An intellectual for sure. And they got him in handcuffs and they're talking about putting him away in a slammer on the mainland forever. Um, so it's it's very troublesome that the First Amendment, you know, is in jeopardy. If we start losing our civil rights, it's not only who's uh, who's on the sidewalk yelling at you, it's not only that your legislature is completely, you know, out of its mind and knocking off um, uh, social social security, it's your very life. Where do you find the point that you begin questioning whether you should have a gun in the house? That's right. It's the, it's the right way to frame it. It's the right question. What's the point at which you take self-help? Yeah. Well, Chuck? <clears throat> well, I think one of the things that we really need to pay attention to from the lessons from Douglas is he did connect the dots. We can, the four of us do, and many people do, but many don't. But one is that Trump not only incites and motivates political violence <clears throat> to its ultimate point, up to and including physical harm and death, he also advocates and promises no accountability. He promises, okay, all you January 6th folks, <clears throat> Hey, reelect me, I'll pardon you all. He is an advocate of no accountability for political violence, no matter how extreme, no matter the consequences. Five people died on January 6th. That's on his head. He motivated that. The second thing is the counter example that Douglas provides is he did his very best to humanize the values and the conversation to remind people that's the context in which we need to understand the people, their relationships, and the conduct involved here. And the farther we get away from that, to allow politicized violence to be unaccountable, the farther we'll get from the rule of law. I have to pick on David for a minute. David, do you mind if I pick on you for a minute? No, you go right ahead, Jay. You've done it all your life. Man, okay. Let's keep going. There is a question about whether, you know, the lawyers are doing their job at dealing with uh, the kind of Michigas from from Trump. (laughs) And the American Bar Association, you know, went along. They didn't really complain about what he was doing. Um, They didn't take a position against some of his machinations. Um, and, you know, in general, who in the country knows the law? Who in the country is trained in the rule of law? It's the lawyers. Uh, you remember Shakespeare, you know, the first thing we do. Um, but my, my concern is if you, if you looked around at the bar nationally, 
Um, you would wonder whether the lawyers are willing to lay down their careers, lay down their, you know, their fortunes, their sacred honor, their lives to protect the rule of law. And my answer to you is, I don't think so. You know, you know, that's an interesting question. First, I'm, you know, lawyers do a lot of good, but um, I'm not here to defend the profession because they're the they're the profession that people love to hate. OK, um, you know, everybody loves their lawyer, but they think all the rest of those guys are charlatans. <laughs> OK, so but the lawyers can only operate within the law. I think the the answer to political violence, uh, unfortunately, is communication and doing, you know, having leaders who stand up, leaders who stand up and speak out against it, like Frederick Douglass, leaders who, like Chuck is mentioning, have charisma, have courage, uh, have communication, who can do all of those things, because it is only by serving as positive role models and having those people out there to do that, that we can bring along the better angels in the populace. You know, I have I go back and forth from depression about the American populace um, to hopefulness, uh, you know, when they throw out the election deniers and and we retain democratic control of the Senate for now. Um, and and the Republican red wave uh, does not come in and Donald Trump is getting dissed. I remain hopeful. But other times I think, oh, my God, the country's going to hell in a handbasket. But when you start thinking about the country going to hell in a handbasket, that's where the authoritarians like Donald Trump come along and say, fear, fear, fear. Jay, you're going to lose your civil rights. I got to get these people. I'm going to lock them all up. But I'm not going to lock up you. Uh, but I'm going to lock up all those other bad people. And I am the only one who can save us. OK, and that has been Trump's message before. It's the authoritarian message of Xi Jinping. It's the authoritarian authoritarian message of the, the Hungary president or the, the guys over there. And Victor Orban. Some the, yeah. In some of the Eastern European countries. And unfortunately, I mean, I still believe in liberal democracy. Uh, I, I still believe that that it will win out and that people will uh, respond to that. But sometimes I have my doubts and the lawyers can come along and help, but they are constrained by the laws. How, how, how immune are we in Hawaii to these na this national trends that we're worrying about? Well, just we're just wait until we start getting some gun shooting because of the concealed carry that our esteemed or not so esteemed Supreme Court has fomented here. With all these, now we're gonna have a whole bunch of guns. We're gonna have the DD shooting incident become commonplace, um, and it will be very unfortunate. Very. Yeah, and there's there's a bill in the um, Honolulu uh, City Council that would create gun-free zones, yeah. and there is some pretty strong opposition to that bill. I'm saying, who is doing this? Um, you know, there's a, a Republican group that's growing in the in our state. And taking these positions consistent with the GOP. So the answer, Peter, is I think it's changing. It's dynamic. And we are uh, subject to the same infection. It hasn't gotten as far with us as on the mainland, but we're subject to the same risk right here in Hawaii, even though we're a wonderful blue state still, hopefully. I'm worried about that, too. I worry about the erosion of the social compact here in Hawaii. So, yeah, so, so I, I, far, I, I, uh, let me just make one short comment. The good thing so far is, is we don't have armed black people or armed Chinese people running around shooting a bunch of whites, because I guarantee you, if that happened, all, there would be lockups very seriously. So far, we've got a bunch of white guys with guns out there and and you got Trump and, and everybody going, oh, boys will be boys. Uh, don't worry, they're OK. Uh, but remember when the Black Panthers came along and started holding guns and said political power grows out of the barrel of a gun, that was instantly threatening to the entire populace. You know, uh, every day we post an article in our uh, daily email advisory. I was telling you about this, Chuck, um, and uh, we posted an article about, I think it was the New York Times, about how um, uh, the the Proud Boys or the, uh, what do you call it, the other one? 
Mm. Oath keepers. Yeah, the oath keepers appear at these nonviolent um, protests around the country. They actually cross the country to go there, and they always appear um, in favor of of the the right wing extremist group who's at the protest. Um, and they always have guns. They have assault rifles. They have pistols. They <clears throat> carry all kinds of weapons, and they're dressed in camouflage outfits. And the Times wrote this up and said, you know, we, we should be somewhat concerned um, that, you know, if you carry a gun and you feel strongly or you think you feel strongly about something, the next thing that happens is you use the gun. Um, and so I, I really worry about that because nobody, here's the point, is stopping them. Nobody is saying, you know, you, you can't have the assault weapon in front of the courthouse. You can't do that. Yeah. And, and so they do it. They do it all over the country. This is of great concern because if these are institutions, you know, that they're standing in front of. Chuck, your thoughts? The system is clearly broken. I think that's what David is talking about. Hey, you can be the most knowledgeable, skillful prosecutor out there. You can be Jack Smith, you can be Merrick Garland, you can be Lawrence Scheib, whoever you want. But if the system's not going to perform effectively for you, you're not going to be able to bring Trump and his people to justice. And that's what we're facing right now. It's been out there since Frederick Douglass talked about it. It's still out there. If anything, it's worse than it was within recent times. You know, yeah. Frederick Douglass, I think one of the points he made was, and Anne Applebaum makes the same point in the Atlantic, you know, and, and the Washington Post is, you, you have to speak up. And everybody, sorry, including the lawyers, have to speak up. Um, and they, if, if they see something unfair, unjust, if they see something they don't like, they have to speak up. That's one of the reasons that I'm here and that all of you guys are here. We're speaking up. We're doing what we can. Okay. But my question to Peter is, is, is that enough? Is that enough to respond to Ann Alpabam or Frederick Douglass? Um, how do we, how do we mm, stop this madness? I don't, I, I don't have an answer. I wish I had an answer, Jay. I, I'll, uh, you know, I just, uh, I wish I knew that. That's, uh, it's the, you know, the, the million dollar question about how, what do we do in the face of the obstacles and the potholes and the barriers that we're describing here? Um, I don't know how to tame the anger that's running wild in the country. I think there are programs that can do that, social programs that can get people jobs, get people education, get people health care and ameliorate some of the anger. But it won't, it seems to have reached a pitch. And I think it's partly the social media that is flaming this stuff along. I was in a, I had an opportunity not too long ago to meet Eugene Robinson from Washington Post. And oh, great guy. Really an interesting man. And he said, basically what we have going on in Russia and China and the U.S. is the loss of truth, that we can't embrace truth. And he was very critical of social media and the loose standards that surround anybody who wants to say anything as opposed to what can be done on the, on the traditional media, where they get sued regularly if they, you know, step over the line. So uh, I think he was on to something about truth is under fire. And uh, we, we're seeing that over and over again. And, uh, you know, I think we have to tame the media, the social media's channels that are out there. Not think tech, of course, not think tech. But yeah, let, uh, me, let me just uh, pick up the phone and call Elon Musk. I, I know I can... Uh, I can... <laughs> Make some progress with him. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, David? Well, I, I think communication is important. I think social media is wild and untamed and unaccountable. Uh, you know, it, it's the great democratization of the communications industry, which I think has actually led us to a darker place. And it's, it's sad. There have been great benefits from it, but it is sad. Uh, and and there have been great detriments occasioned by that, uh, so that that people are now free to speak their minds. I mean, I saw this one cartoon where um, you know uh, uh, people were encouraged to speak their minds, be who they want to be, 
So you're talking to you know people of color, gays, uh, uh, people who are outliers, people who are marginalized. Speak up, be yourself. And then there was another panel where he had all these white supremacists going, "Yeah, I want to stand up. I want to speak my truth. I want to go shoot some people." Um, and and so you know that's an unfortunate consequence of of the democratization of communications. And I think that the answer is unfortunately better role models, communication by people who, who, you know, hopefully we will speak to an educated populace, but I'm not so sure, you know, education's kind of going down. Uh, so, so uh, you know, will reason triumph? Uh, will intelligence triumph? Uh, I certainly hope so, but the jury is still out and it is a close question. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, um, I think we ought to go around the table here and make final, you know, integrated comments on where all this leads and where it goes, um, you know, to, to see what what you distill out of it and uh, what you would tell people for posterity. Posterity now, Chuck, this is posterity we're talking about. We're talking about your children's children's children, uh, that they would look at this, you know, decades from now and say, Gee, that that Chuck Crumpton, he was really thoughtful and precious. He he knew what was going to happen. Let's let's have it, Chuck. Well, I think one of the things, and David has hit on it, <clears throat> we need to make <clears throat> the information that offers the richest learning potential <clears throat> available, attractive, and motivating <clears throat> to children and youth <clears throat> as early and as pervasively as we can. <clears throat> Douglas and others, Tubman, many, Booker T, all should be not just available, but standard for people's awarenesses growing up through elementary, middle, high school, and beyond. It, if we can get those voices heard and listened to and appreciated, there may be an opportunity for better and more critical thinking and more demand for truth. Okay, David, um, your thoughts and while and while we're saying this and talking about education, there are <clears throat> thousands, if not millions, of people in the South who are burning books, who are um, you know trying to control <clears throat> school board meetings, uh, who are taking every step they can to undermine a liberal education. Uh, and do we have the time to fix that? Do we have the opportunity to fix that? Anyway, your, law, your last thoughts on this, David. Well, my, my last thoughts are past his prologue. Frederick Douglass was fighting the fight back then against the evils that existed in the, the mid-1800s. And he did a tremendous job. He was a tremendous advocate, a tremendous intellect. And he had it right, which is tolerance, equality, uh, ecumenicalism, you know, and, and lifting everybody up results in a better thing. However, his message is not always heard. And, you know, there's that old saying, those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Um, and, and I, you know, I think people just have to learn and, and, and apply the lessons of history. And the final thing I say is, is I agree with what you said, Jay. Uh, everybody has to speak up. They have to speak up. I mean, that's that old uh, uh, story by who is that uh, Franz Niebuhr who said, you know, uh, when they when they came for the blacks, I didn't speak up. When they came for the Catholics, I didn't speak up. When they came for the, you know, this guy and that guy, I didn't speak up. And then they came for me, and there was nobody left to speak up. And that's the problem. And uh, as much as I, you know, as much as I, I find that there are feelings of liberal democracy. I haven't found a better way that we can all work together. And so I'm still hopeful, although I have my doubts and my depressive moments, I'm still hopeful that we will muddle through. Yes, madam. Now that you ask, this, this is uh, from Benjamin Franklin, right? Yes, madam. Now that you ask, we are going to have a democratic republic if you can keep it. It does require some effort. Um, Peter, uh, your last thoughts. Well, I'm in the same place as Chuck and David and you, I think. And I just go back to those same three principles. 
uh, that Frederick Douglass talked about in 1869. Absolute equality for all, not partial equality, absolute, complete racial diversity, the composite nation, and religious tolerance and religious liberty for everybody. We need a new Frederick Douglass. We need new people to, to ch in, in put life into those statements. And I don't think we have to embellish them. I just think that they're grand and uh, they just need to be reinvigorated by new leaders and a new generation. Now we have to take the video of this show um, and make people listen. You know, like fry their eyes open. What was the name of that movie? Fry their eyes open so they, they have to listen. Um, and, and that's the problem. And to expose them to this kind of discussion, these kinds of thoughts. Well, thank you very much, Peter Adler, David Louis, Dr. Crumpton. Great conversation. Thank uh, you, Jim. And let me I, answer one essential question. Yes, it went further than I thought it would go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Oh. Oh. <laughs>